We're going to learn how to create a Krea slash Magnific.ai clone using free and open source tools. So you can go from this image to this image. And for those that want to use it, the workflow is in the description alongside all the files and the prompts I used here. It's entirely free, of course, as it should be. Let's go. So after a brief meeting with my aliens overlord, I remembered that a Krea clone was the first thing I tried with Confi because the centralization, which also equates censorships in some cases, and the high cost of cloud services was not to my liking. I gave up afterwards because I didn't really see the need for it and I thought videos were much cooler anyway. Still, I don't want you to just copy and paste a file guys, so I'd like to teach you how it works, but more importantly, why it works. So I'm gonna build this thing with you together in this video and a fairly moderate to high level of skills is required for most of my videos, just so you know. So if there's something you don't understand, please remember you can always ask the community on my Discord, the link is in the description. First, let's look at the tools themselves. We have two major players right now, Krea and Magnific.ai, and to be absolutely crystal clear, I have nothing against these tools. In fact, I bought a license of Krea. I'm not reverse engineering anything. It's just that I would prefer to run most of what they do locally. So guys, please call back your lawyers. It's just for fun. Okay, so let's try to understand what this does. I've loaded a picture of my wife about 20 years ago. It was taken on the cheapest digital camera I could buy at the time. And I would like to upscale this because it's a fond memory. So if we look at what it does, yeah exactly as I expected. So, I mean, I'm not too bothered about the noise on the ground that leads to this weird pattern. I am much more bothered about the face because, well, um, that's that's not my wife. I know there are settings that you can use. You can prompt it. Usually it auto prompts. So we need to remember that they have an auto prompt feature. They also have what's called an AI strength feature, which seems to be directly linked to probably what the denoise setting does in a case sampler. The resemblance setting is probably something to do with IP adapters, detailer and control nets and clarity uh, I don't know probably a sharpening filter of some sort in general I found that this tool struggled with faces but did a very good job on things like clothing and also it doesn't understand firearms but that's okay because that's a limitation of the technology they probably don't have gun LoRa's and uh, guns are bad in general don't have guns I never touched a gun personally look that's not even me so what are you talking about as I went to test more and more, I just found the same thing over and over again. Really good at objects and things like that, but really bad at faces. Okay, fine. Another thing that was really interesting is if you upload an image that's already high quality, for example, this one that I created in the previous tutorial and had already upscaled, I find that the output was really pleasant. It's really good fun to see that you can change the eye color. We can do this in Confi, I'm pretty sure of that. But where it really shines is the amount of detail added to the face, like those freckles, in a way that's consistent with what you would expect. And that, I'm gonna tell you up front, spoiler alert, I don't think we can do it with Confi. And that's okay. I mean, this, as I said, these tools have their reason to exist but I don't want you to have the wrong expectations. These are commercial platforms with millions of dollars. We're not gonna be able to rebuild their clusters of A100s in your bedroom. We can try to get close. If you feel that these results are quote unquote terrible, please understand we're not gonna be able to build something better, but we can try our best anyway. And the best way to learn, I found, especially in these early days when we don't have much documentation, is by building, building, building. Another thing that I found is this PDF file by user Elon Knight from the Banodoko server who published his findings on these tools. And I have to say he's done an amazing job at explaining what they did and in what order. And it also highlights the fact that it's likely very difficult to reproduce this in Confi, but I'm the kind of guy who likes to hear no, so I went ahead anyways. So to get started, you want to first make sure that your version of Confi UI is up to date please, please, please go and update this right now. It needs to be at least the 25th of February and make sure that all your custom nodes have been updated to the current date. All right, so we're gonna need two groups. The first one is gonna be our diffusion step. There you go. And I have the strong feeling that they use a two-step process on those websites. The second is gonna be the upscale process. It's always optional, so I might as well copy what they do. There you go, upscale. Then we need to load our image, we're gonna use load image, of course. And we'll pick any old image. This one is 20 years old, I'm not getting any younger. There you go. Next, we need to clean it up a bit. So cool tip here, you can use load upscale model and pick a model called 1D JPEG Omni SR. That's going to basically remove the pixels from your image without upscaling it. Kinda cool tip there. Let's go click those noodles and preview it. Now, 
we want to compare it, but first let's queue it. There you go, make sure it works. Yeah, it works. Want to probably add a comparer here. We're going to use RG3 image compare, which is excellent. Definitely download that if you haven't. Let's click the noodles. There you go. Oops. Oh, it's a bit difficult to record and noodle at the same time, but I did it. There you go. Q and now we can compare. Is it good? Meh. It works. A lot of things in Confi are a bit superstitious. I didn't want to have a noisy image, plus it's a cool tip anyway. Right, so now we need to load our checkpoint. Uh, we're going to pick load checkpoint. I'm partial to Copax Timeless if you watch these videos regularly, but be careful because SDXL is behaving very different from 1.5. We'll use both anyway. So next, we're going to need to encode our image because that's going to form the latent that we're going to pass to the case sampler. Let's connect the noodles. There you go. And now we need a prompt, a positive and a negative. So I'm going to use the standard clip text encode SDXL that comes with confi, connect the clip and create a second one for the negative. There you go. Uh, so There's a difference between G and L. If you're not familiar, I will have a tutorial on this. For now, we're going to use the same text in both. I'll put highly detailed. There you go. Breathtaking, breathtaking and photograph. And I'll pass that to L. There you go. And now uh, here for the negative, we're going to pretend that there is no copyrighted material in those models. <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble again and put blurry text and watermark and pass that to both G and L. There you go. Done. Right now I need a lot more space, guys, a lot more space. I can't work in these conditions. I cannot work. Right. So let's drag this over there all the way there. Make this way bigger. There you go. Um, if I can click it, that would be better. There you go. Right. So now uh, let's see, let's add a case sampler. Um, so I'm going to connect my model to the sampler, my conditioning positive, my conditioning negative, And now I'm going to pass it that prompt. So we need to have a latent. That's the image. I'm going to change the settings. Uh, not a big fan of this seed built in the sampler. So I'm going to switch it to a widget. And I'm going to pass an RG3 seed. I love that thing, by the way. Really useful to keep all your seeds into one place. Really nice. Drag this over to seed. And I know the settings by heart by now. I mean, I've done this so many times. Just put 50 in there. Uh, the CFG is usually more realistic if you put it on 3, 4. After that, it becomes a little bit plasticky, if you see what I mean. Uh, it's one of the rare models that supports DPM. 3 uh, DPM plus plus 3M. So I'm going to use this Keras. I prefer that scheduler and the denoise value is going to be 0 0.7. We're going to play with that to see the results. That's how much it's going to influence the image, if you will. So now we search for our vdecode and we're done. Let's drag this over there. Make sure we're not forgetting anything. Uh, probably over here. I want to compare it. Oops. I want to compare it to the image. Oh yeah, you can rename these things, by the way. You just click the dot, right? It's, that's the trick. Just click the little dot. Don't click the text. Cool image. Because it's cool. Rename, reference, image. There you go. And because I lost the noodle, let's drag it again. There you go. Up. You can hit the space bar to move around. Just use that. It's much easier. And yeah, there you go. That way you don't mess up your workflow, okay? All right, so I spent five days recording this tutorial, believe it or not. So it's very important to me that you learn stuff and not just follow or God forbid, just download the thing and press the button. OK, um, let's hit new fixed random here. Uh, that's because we want to leverage the cache of Confi UI, which is excellent at caching things. Uh, next, uh, what we can do is uh, organize in tabs. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is use the fast group bypasser by RG3. And that's going to allow us to enable or disable the upscale so we can iterate. This is the name of the game. I have a video on that. It's all numbers. It's a numbers game. So you want to iterate as many times as you can and as fast as you can, especially if you don't have a 4090. Uh, the other thing you can do to be more productive is install useful extensions like this one, for example, I use Confi UI Workspace Manager to go and organize my work into folders with tags. Uh, you can do all sorts of things with this tool. And for people like me who make educative videos, it's extraordinarily useful. Let's see if I made any mistake. It looks about right. Let's just hit Q prompt, see what it does. 
Okay, yeah, so the denoise is way too high. So what's happening, for those that don't know, is if you have a denoise that's too high, it just reinvents the entire image to whatever it thinks uh, should fit the mold, right? So let's change this to something far more reasonable, like 0.2 maybe at most Q. And let's see what it gives us. All right, well, yeah, it's something. We're making progress. We're starting somewhere, we gotta start somewhere. But it's not gonna turn heads, that's for sure. So how do we fix this? Well, first of all, I think that my model, and in fact, I know so because I'm technically from the future. I've done this tutorial five days ago, you see. So I know that probably playing with a different model might be a good place to start before we start with the more complicated things like IP adapter, control nets, Zoe depth, etc. Let's go with the simple stuff. So I'm going to do a number of things. First, I'm going to change the model to something like, say, um, realistic vision is really good. So let's go with that. And now I need to change, obviously, my clip text encode because these are for SDXL. We weren't using it properly anyway. So let's ditch this. Okay, this is a good time to tell you that when you work with Confi, it's all about iterating and going fast. So at first you do something quick and dirty like what I'm doing now, and then you clean it up. All right, so let's change this to green and this to red because I know a lot of you guys enjoy this little color thing. And now we drag our clip and our conditioning into the right location. There you go. Click, click. There's a faster way to do this. I'll show you later. Uh, then we copy paste our prompts and now we're going to adjust our steps because obviously this is a, a 1.5 model. I know it takes about 30 steps-ish. I'm sick and tired of changing the CFG. Let's, let's put auto CFG, shall we? So auto CFG is an extension, um, note set if you will, allows you to automatically calculate the CFG. Once you start using it, you lose control over the CFG parameter. Uh, evidently, it has limitation. You can bypass it. Uh, one reason you may want to bypass it is because you're going for a specific artistic effect. Uh, in this case, I want to use it uh, very much again about iterating fast. Switch the sampler to the correct one. The scheduler stays on Keras. I'm happy with that. Uh, let's see. I'm going to get rid of this box. I don't need it anymore. Let's delete those. Let's organize this a little bit. And now. I would like to cue my prompt. So let's look at the results. No, that's too low. So let's change it again and let's flip it to say 0, 04. Yeah, that should do. In fact, I know it does. So look at that. Oh, my wife became white. Oh, that's weird. Well, I would say the quality is way better. It's definitely going the direction I want. I know I can use Photoshop for that to say change the brightness, change the contrast, etc. Right, so now I'm going to load a different picture because it will be a different set of setting, a different set of everything every time you change the image. Let's use the one where I'm holding a banana. And right, there you go. This was pretty fast. So yeah, the vegetation has been corrected the way I saw Magnific and Korea do it, but the face, of course the face, and the, the banana looks very different. So that, I think, I won't have a fix for the banana, but we can use Face Detailer to fix the face later. Okay, so I think here we can add a few quick wins before we go any further. Uh, basically, what I don't like is having to retype this prompt every single time. So what we're going to do is we're going to move it over somewhere where we can see. We're going to have to clean up the noodles, but I have a video on that, so uh, I won't bother you with this right now. Uh, and we're going to use the Moon Dream Interrogator. Now, there's something really important written here, and that's no commercial use, and they mean it. So please, please, please be careful with that, okay? No commercial use. Pinky promise. So <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to concatenate uh, the text that we had with the output of this visual model. And we use Python GOS extensions here. They're really good. The show text one uh, comes with another one where you can play an MP3 file of your own voice when you queue finish. Maybe I should make that a tip. It's good fun. In any case, uh, let's add our multiple line text. Uh, this one is going to come from the was note suit. We're going to use a lot of different extensions here. You might do a bit of downloading. And we're going to make a second one. And that's going to be our prompt override to override our prompt so we don't have to go through Moondream every single time. And for choosing, we use the impact switch. That's from the impact pack. The same guy who did the config manager. Really cool. You also need to check this out. Uh, I'm going to go and change the title so we know what we're looking at. That's the override. And here I'm going to put a 
concatenate. This one comes from the configural suite. So I concatenate the highly detailed blah, blah, blah with the content of Moondream, but I want it to be on a switch. So I go through my switch. There you go. Oh, there you go. And put my second input, might as well rename new slots. Again, right click on the dot, not on the text, on the dot. And here we're going to call it um, over, over right. There you go. Uh, right. So now we select two. That's going to be our override. And I'm going to make a little bit of space here on the screen because I'm running out of space again. Right. So let's uh, transfer this into an input so I can pass my string. And yeah, it looks good. But uh, oh, I'm missing my image. Yeah, <laughs> big problem. All right, let's drag this over there. OK, uh, now here. Uh, the text. So tell me everything you know about this image. My life depends on it. Yeah, I know it's funny, but it's true. It works. You can uh, sort of blackmail the models. It works. I'm serious. So now uh, switch this to GPU and Q. Right. Uh, oh, well, nothing happens. And that's because I didn't turn on remote code execution. This is dangerous, by the way. We're trusting developers with our data, so be mindful of that. But it works. Look, uh, we got this really good text. I'm quite happy with the outcome here. In fact, I couldn't have typed all this every single time I changed picture. So we're going to save a lot of time. But we want to copy this into our backup, or I should say override. Switch this to one. Press go, and let's look at the output. Uh, actually, that looks a little bit more structured, and that makes sense because we're using a prompt to tell the engine what to draw. So we're getting really close to the Cree output, and we haven't even done that much work. It was literally 15 minutes. Now we're missing a big part, and that's the upscaler. So let's get to it. So you probably know already that there's multiple types of upscaler. Some of them work in pixel space, some of them work in latent space, and depending on which one you choose, one will modify the image, that's the latent upscaler, and those that work in the pixel space won't modify the image as much. In this case, however, we don't care if it modifies the image. In fact, we encourage it. So I think it would be a good time to try something new, and that's CCSR. CCSR is an upscaler developed by Kijai. Well, technically, it's more of a wrapper node for something called a super resolution upscaler that uses stable diffusion without prompts. And if you think about it, it's perfect for a situation. So here I downloaded the real world checkpoint, which is available on the site that hosts this node. And it's been trained on real world images. We live in the real world. Perfect. I'll pick that. You pass it to the actual upscaler and you obviously need to give it an image in and an image out. That, that goes without saying. Next, we're going to pick a resize method. I'm going to go with length source because I find that it gives the best image in my test. You might want to play with that. Next, we pick a scale too. Next, I'm going to leave you a little love note because the steps that you choose are going to work in conjunction with your scale. So as for you not to waste GPU cycles, I'm going to leave the recommended scale to steps proportion. You can also choose the start and stop at. And it's by playing with the start step that will be able to erase the seams created by the tiling system, which is also optional. You have three modes, CCSR, CCR tile mix diff, and CCR tile Vegotian. Mix diff introduces seams, hence the need to play with the steps. And Vegotian introduces noises, but doesn't have the seams. And that kind of makes me think I should probably make a video about CCSR because there's too many options and I need to move fast. Anyways, I'll choose Aiden instead of Wavelet because my image quality doesn't warrant using Wavelet. Uh, and then finally, I'll put a seed a 7.7. Seven. There you go, lucky seed. And I'll put it on fixed so it doesn't rerun every time I hit Q. Right, good. Now, I'll go grab my image, which is sitting in the other group. Let's go grab that. I'm going to show you how to clean up the noodles as well. Just let's do everything in this tutorial. Why not? This is going to be a how to config UI tutorial after all. <laughs> all right. So let's save our image because it's going to take so long to process CCSR. I don't want you to lose your images. And so that implies that you should only run the upscale if you're absolutely sure that your image is good. Okay. Let's hit Q. And we're going to have time to look at other things while this runs. So I'm going to start by adding a watermark that's from Configural. It's brilliant, by the way. Just drag my image to that, send it to the save, and we're going to put CCSR. So remember what we did, because when we browse images, it's a lot nicer to see what the image is rather than read a complicated file name. 
I'm gonna save you time as well. Let's put 70 in the font size because this is gonna be a big image. And we're pretty much done. Now let's go back to this part of the workflow and I'm gonna try to clean this up a little bit. Uh, I'll use a lot of free routes. So let's put one in from RG3. Uh, they're usually controlled by keyboard shortcuts, but uh, unfortunately there's a bug right now that prevents me from doing that. So I have to right click, choose allow resizing, and I'm gonna put uh, a title that's gonna be representing my image, output image, there you go. And I'm gonna ask it to show the label. Again, the shortcuts for some reason not working, I don't know why. Let's drag this over there and let's put this as an output of this group. That's how I usually organize myself. And we're gonna drag this into the input of the upscaler and voila. So this one is finished running. Let's have a look. Yeah, it looks really nice, really clean, a little bit too sharp for my taste, but that's not really important. I don't see any tiles or anything like that. So I don't have to mess with the settings. I'm very happy with this outcome. Uh, the only problem is obviously my base image still not great. Uh, let's try to change the scale to four and hit Q. So the downside of CCSR, as you probably guessed, is extraordinarily slow. I'm gonna pause the video because this is gonna take about seven minutes to run on my 4090. So we need an alternative. I think in this case, since speed matters uh, more than anything else, because we're still in the exploratory stage, is load the upscale model. And obviously we apply it by doing a upscale image using model. We drag this to that and we select a model. Which one are we gonna pick? CX gives good results, but since speed matters the most here, ERS GAN is gonna be the correct one to pick. So I want to organize myself a little bit better here. So I wanna show you something. Let's reduce the size of this group and let's move this all the way over there. Okay, so uh, let's make this a little bit smaller. And this is what takes the most time, is organizing your notes. Honestly, it's what takes forever. Uh, but I wanted to show you how it's done so that you can organize your workflow a little bit better. We're gonna put this one at the back of the CCSR and change the title to something like CCSR Final Upscale. And we're gonna grab these two nodes and we're gonna paste them over here after we move that a little bit more to the right. There you go. And now we can resize this a little bit more, add another group. This is gonna be obviously the upscale via pixel space group. I'm gonna make this a little bit larger and we're gonna drag the nodes so we understand what we're doing. This will also help you understand my workflow when you see all the groups, etc. And this is just one of the way you can organize yourself, by the way. You don't have to do this. It's just nicer, in my opinion. Let's drag it over here. Let's bring that back. And now we can drag this over there. Now everything is connected. So if you will, it's like uh, running in serial. If this was an electrical circuit, if I hit one on my bookmarks, I go back to this and now I'm presented with a way to switch between groups. So I think it's quite convenient because now I've disabled my CCSR, I hit Q, and before I know it, it's already gonna be run. Now I can also do the other way around, uh, but I, so, and I could do both, but that would not be a very good idea. Uh, let's try to resize this because it's way too big, and we're gonna switch this to a 4X Q, and this is blazing fast. Uh, there you go, done. This took about 1.5 seconds. So I mean, seven minutes versus a few seconds, I know which one I would pick. All right, so we still need to insert the IP adapters to control nets, if not more. We need to standardize all this to fit a meaningful workflow with free UV2, a LoRa loader, deep shrink, a face detailer, and joyous of all joys. We need a two-pass system using custom samplers. So let me make you a deal. So you don't have to watch 10 hours of me moving nodes around. I'm going to organize everything into empty groups. And in exchange, I'm going to teach you how to properly organize your nodes. I'll see you in a second. And we're back. Oh, oh wait, no, that's, yeah, that's the wrong workflow. This is the correct workflow. Now, before you scream, two things. Number one, everything, and I mean everything, including the intermediary workflow that we've been looking at, are going to be in a zip file hosted on the site where I upload these things. Second, I did not add 
too much here, believe it or not. What I've done is everything that's new, I've put into fast bypasser groups and I've organized the code into meaningful boxes like this one. There's a box just for seed. There's a box just for model or group. There's a group just for the prompt and so on and so forth. But if you pay attention, you'll see it's the exact same prompt that we had before, the exact same technique, it just looks better. The one thing to remember is how I organize my workflows. So usually I think like a programmer because I come from a programming background. And if you're familiar with programming, you know that you have variables in going into a function, variables out going out of a function. It's the same thing here. I have a variable coming into my prompt. That's the what I call the base image. That's the only thing I need because my prompt is generated through Moondream. And I have variables out. What does a prompt return? Conditioning. So I've put com plus, com minus, and that's obviously the output. And likewise for the unclip section, which we're not going to use yet, but we're going to look into a second. I have two conditionings going in, com plus, com minus, and they're linked. Really easy, but I think it's cleaner than doing something like this, for example. If I did this, yeah, that looks ugly. This is a little bit cleaner. Okay, so let's go look at the beginning of our workflow. We initially load a model like we used to. It's just that I've added some useful thing that I know a lot of you enjoy. And I want to take you through, if you're not familiar with these items, what they do and how they work. First, we load the checkpoint, nothing new here. What you can do is build a little bus like this with all these functions and place them into subgroups like this, colored a specific color by choosing edit group color and then select into the muters which I've linked using bookmarks the color that you want to filter for. I have a tutorial on this as well but for the sake of this one just go into properties and choose matching color cyan or in the case of the model options I've chosen yellow of course there it is. So going back to the model. First, I want to give you an option to load LoRa's. It can be useful because ultimately what we're doing is stable diffusion. So if I right click this and choose bypass, um, I can enable it. And there's some LoRa's in there that I enjoy using. I'll have tutorials on those. I'm a new channel, so please bear with me while I build my content. Next up, we have clip set last layer. This can be useful for some models that require a clip skip, meaning that it's skipping, if you will, a step in the layers of text embedding of your model. If you're not familiar with this, just remember that some models require a clip skip of one. Usually that's the realistic models in SD1.5 and the anime model usually take a minus two. But again, this is not a hard and fast rule. You'll have to check on Civit AI per model. Talking about models, again, using this extension that I have here, you can click models and look for them. If you click one, it's gonna take you straight to the Civit AI page and it's gonna point out the clip skip right here. So I hope this is helpful and that you've learned a little something here. Next up, we have SAG. What is SAG, you ask? Well, what? You don't know what SAG is? What do you mean you don't know this? Everyone knows this. Now I'm just teasing you. This is just for the commenters that feel a little bit nitpicky about the job I do. Uh, essentially, it's a form of combining the idea of CFG, if you're familiar with this, with that of self-attention. It's complicated math and a full explanation wouldn't fit this tutorial. So I recommend you go and check out this page if you're interested in the math of it. Some people argue that SAC can help adding detail to the image, but in my test, what I found is it would mess it up more than anything else. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It's complex. I included it for the sake of being complete. And let's close our model box. Next is free UV2. Very popular because, well, as the name indicate, it's free. And mean by free, I don't mean just free as in beer. I mean also free as in speech, but it's also free in terms of computational resources. Now, because again, free UV2 is outside the scope of this tutorial, I've included a little box of recommended settings that you can play with. Just remember, these are the general guidelines. If you want details, user Siberian Duck on Reddit made a very good post explaining the finer details of it. And I found that is mostly accurate. So this is a really good read. We're going to leave it disabled. Next, we have Deep Shrink. Again, here we're doing diffusion. So Deep Shrink is useful to a certain extent. What is Deep Shrink, you ask? Well, essentially, it's a simple to use node. You just implemented in your model pipeline. And what it will do is it will create a better composition, maybe a better background, maybe sharper image. 
maybe faster render times, even in some cases, when you do latent upscaling, which is the name, the complicated name, if you will, for what is known as high res fix. It is useful, it has its usage, but in this case, I'm not gonna use it, so bypass. And then finally, we have auto CFG. Auto CFG does exactly what it says on the tin. It sets your CFG for you, so you don't have to. Why would you wanna use something like this? I mean, you're gonna lose control, right? Yes, you will. But it's useful because in this case, what we're only interested in is quickly iterating between models, quickly choosing a model and not having to worry about switching the CFG. We already have to change the steps. We already have to change the sampler. It just makes life a lot easier to use auto CFG. So that one is something I'm gonna use when I switch models and all of these are controlled with the switches. So I have a bookmark for the switches, which is two. You hit two and you're presented with the switches. And here you can enable and disable them. Then you click the little arrow and it takes you there. And as you can see, it's been enabled. We don't need them for now, so let's keep them off. I wanna keep everything as it was and demonstrate to you that this is the exact same workflow, just better organized, more option. It's kind of fun. I always organize my tutorials the same way over and over again so it's easy for you to keep track of and I try to reuse the same structure so you're gonna see this used a lot. Think of it a bit like a book. If I was to write a book about Confi, I would have a preface, subchapters and so on. And it's the same here. Think the chapters as groups and the nodes as paragraphs of text and the tree structure is maintained using context big from RG3. So this saves a lot of noodles on the screen and then I simply drop a context which I can extend every time I need something in a group. I drop it twice usually to keep it clean and I continue the chain like this and so on and so forth ad vitam aeternam. And one last thing, the samplers have been changed to custom samplers. They work exactly like your standard case sampler, okay? It's the exact same thing, except you can pass a model and specifically you can pass the sigmas, you can pass the latent image, the seed and the CFG using parameters and that's all linked to a case sampler box. And why did I do that? Well, because it's easier to sort of eyeball this image and say, well, that's clearly from a video game. So I'm gonna need this, I'm gonna need that. It's simply easier to do it this way from like a little control panel. If you're really into control panels, I recommend Trunks node 0246, which allow you to build what essentially is a type of GUI for Confi using a little control panel. Uh, but again, this is outside the scope of this tutorial. So now let's get back to the tutorial itself. So the other change that I've made is that I've put the upscaler in front of the case sampler. And I've given you options. You can use the CCR upscale or you can use a model upscale if you don't have enough VRAM or you s your machine can't take it. In any case, I found that upscaling first had much better results than upscaling last. And for those that have an eagle eye, you probably notice that it says first pass here. That's because yes, we're gonna put a second pass. It's in the final tutorial. And since we've only used one case sampler, I think this is pretty damn good on its own, honestly. And the reason I point this out is I know that it's tempting to want to use Unclip, it's tempting to want to use IP adapter, it's tempting to use control nets, of course, and all of this we're going to implement, but hey, this isn't bad for a first thing. And I know that we're not gonna be able to reproduce Magnific in the browser anyway. One of the reasons for that is that the tunneling system in Magnific is extraordinarily complex. And I wanted to give credit to a user on the Banodoko server that has replicated the entirety of their tunneling system. And I think we can all agree this is maybe not something we wanna get into right now because this is slowing down my 4090 and I haven't queued it yet. It's complex. And if you're into this, I will link you up so you can give it a try and you can replicate all this at home. But I found that it was outside the scope of this tutorial. We're here for good results from the get-go in a simple few nodes. And I think this is actually really good. But the million dollar question is, can we make it better? And the answer is yes. So I've loaded the market image again. I'm quite happy with the outcome, really. I mean, this is such a big improvement. If we go at the comparison, yeah, there's no doubt that this is so much better. And of course the face is not great, but we knew this was going to be a problem. But first problem I think we need to address is the colors. I don't think they look very good. So we're going to add a color match node. And that basically is going to take a reference from the first image, which is the smaller image, and pass it to the larger image we've just upscaled to match colors that will be doing a pretty decent job. It's not always necessary to run this, but it's nice to have. And you also have the Jovi Matrix node if you want more in-config editing type nodes. 
Next, we're going to need a face detailer because by definition, we do not have a reference image for the face since it's an old image. So I'm going to drag a context. I'm going to copy paste it past the correct image. I've made that mistake many times. And I'm going to need an ultra lytics detector provider. So let's go find that. That's in the impact pack. Uh, ultra lytics detector provider. Make sure you get the one from the impact pack if you have multiple nodes. And we need a SAM loader. Now they take models. I'm going to use the 8M because I find the results to be very good. As for the other one, I didn't download the extra models. So I'll just make sure it's stuck to GPU and off we go. Next, we need a simple detector that's going to, well, detect the faces or I should say face, face, faces. And we're going to hook it up to our B-Box loader and our SAM loader. We're going to drag an image to it. That's our image that has been passed to the key sampler. Then we add a detailer debug segs. Again, here, be very careful because if you pick the wrong one, it's not going to work. So make sure you get the right node. After that, we're going to need to drag or image here and connect everything to it by dragging this context, holding control releasing. That's kind of magical, but hey, like all the all other form of magic, be careful because sometimes it gets confused with the positive and the negative. Um, next, I'm going to change the settings because ultimately this is just another case sampler. Seed needs to be lucky, so that's 777. Uh, fix because I don't want to have to rerun it every time I queue. Steps needs to be in line with our other case samplers, so 70 in this case. Uh, CFG at 1 because we use auto CFG. Sampler needs to be, I can never pronounce that one, the 3, the 3 version, okay? I think you know what I mean. Keras for the scheduler, denoise is too high at 0 0.5, but I'll leave it here so you can see the outcome. Um, and a preview. So let's go get that. We're also going to get the preview for the individual faces because I find that convenient. It helps me understand how many phases were found, extra, extra. Next, uh, we're going to go and queue this. There's no reason to wait. We want to see results. I'm going to wait a bit. Uh, this is going to take as long as your graphics card will take to process each face and re-render each face. It's trying to detail every face that it finds. I'm going to show you in a second how to fix that. And yeah, it's picked up two faces, but this one is really blurry. So I don't like that. Sometimes it tries to detail them. So let's put in a filter uh, that's called a sex filter ordered. You drag the sex to the filter and then the filter sex, that is the big faces will go first into that one. And the smaller faces will go here. Control shift V if you want to copy every connection. So that's done here. We're going to pick uh, one face starting at zero. Arrays always are addressed from zero onwards. We're going to drag a preview here. There you go. And I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to copy this too because I'm tired of selecting it in the list. And there you go. Done. So I'm going to press Q and we're going to come back when it's finished so you don't waste time. And it's finished. So yeah, it's important to always uh, maximize your picture a bit to see the results. I think this is a little bit too strong sometimes, especially if you have a bad quality picture, uh, it gets really evident that the face was changed. It's it's basically in painting, right? So we're going to lower this to 0 0.3. Um, the other thing is usually what I would do here, I would type face, face less, pardon me, uh, 3.0 and I would run it and what it does is it would try to blur this face out rather than reconstruct them You see how it's tried to reconstruct this one. It's definitely improved it now. It worked this time but Usually it doesn't and sometimes it can pick up people that are backwards to you backwards to the camera Unfortunately, there's a little bug right now in this uh, note suite So faceless doesn't work and that's a shame uh, it triggers the uh, tokenizer error, but hey, no big deal it, it will it's useful to know for the future for you guys So let's go and check out our image. You can see that It's actually rethought the image and placed this lady over there and it's completely reinvented my wife. Great. Um, <laughs> she's going to be so pleased when she sees this video. We're still saving the image with a, a little watermark here. Uh, I'm quite happy with the results. The thing is, again, this is a numbers game, guys. So on this image, it works. Let's try another image, actually. OK, so I went and I literally snipped a picture from a website. And that picture was really bad quality. You can see all the pixels, etc. cetera. Uh, little word of advice. The first case sampler is always going to do 
most of the heavy lifting. Okay. Uh, usually the second case sampler is going to be to, for example, remove the seams from the passes of the CCSR uh, using tile diffusion. We'll touch on that a little bit later. So make sure that when you do trials like this, you don't en enable any upscale, anything like that. Okay. At first, just to see the results. Now I enabled the face detailer. Hopefully it didn't damage the picture. Uh, yeah, that looks really good on the first case sampler. And here's the work done by the face detailer. Yeah, it definitely did something. Uh, whether or not you like the output, that's a matter of taste. Again, change the settings if you don't like the output. This is going to be done on a by picture basis. It's the pluses of using Config UI for this kind of thing. It's also the minus because it's not a one click thing, right? So let's look at the output. Oh, I'm very happy with this. I'm very, very, very happy with this. You can really see the difference between the original image and the output. And that's just a 2x subscale. I could have done a 4x and then a second 4x on the final result. I really like the job it did on the beard. It reinvented the face. But yeah, I mean, we have denoise set really high right now. Now, the problem with that is that we're only using a face. If it was a body extra, how do we make sure the clothes that's transferred? It works 95% of the time. What about that 5% when it doesn't work? So we're going to need something called IP adapter to be implemented here to sort of transfer a style, uh, the clothing, the hair color, etc., onto the resulting image. Let's go and implement this now. Okay, so I prepared a little group for IP adapter right over here, and it's gonna take two parameters in, a model and an original image. It wants the original image so it can copy its style. And the way it works is it takes the model that's gonna go to the case sampler, it modifies it, and it returns a single parameter, which is model updated. I kinda like this notion of talking about it like it was a function, because that's pretty much what it is. There's a couple of things to note about IP adapter before we move on. So let's go and have a look at the original paper. First of all, IP adapter is not a one thing, it's multiple models and IP adapter nodes encapsulate them and allows you to use all of them as part of your project. So that's important to understand. And that means, and I left you a little love note here so that you can remember it, that when you use 1.5, you're gonna need different models than if you were to use SDXL. So my recommendation is do all your 1.5 modifications first, switch, to the SDXL model by just clicking the little drop down menu and follow this table if you're getting confused. It's, it's pretty straightforward and plus you'll end up remembering them by heart after a while. So let's go and implement it. First, I'm going to need to grab my prepare image for clip vision because IP adapter is not going to like you pushing a giant image in. Second, I'm going to need to load my IP adapter model itself. So that's my IP adapter, SD5, SDXL, etc. Next, I need to go and apply the IP adapter, if I can type this properly, where is it there? Uh, and next, I need to load my ClipVision model. That's my VIT big G or VIT H. Usually it's VIT H, but refer to the table once again. So now I choose a resize uh, method, length source looks better, as you know, a crop position of center. Now usually I would go and create a mask and this and that, uh, but this is a tutorial, so we're gonna do it quick. I'm gonna put a little preview. Oh, and word of warning, this preview do take time, especially if you have a VD code before that, so use them sparingly. Next, I'm going to choose my IP adapter model, make sure it match my clip vision model. Uh, I'm using SDXL, so I refer to the little table. I choose IP adapter plus SDXL V H. And the reason for that is it's, it's a little bit stronger than the regular IP adapter. If it's too strong, switch it back to the regular one. Again, depends on your image entirely. Uh, we need V H here, so I'll go for that. Again, refer to the table. So I'm gonna drag this over there, drag this over here, drag my image to the apply IP adapter, boom. And I'm gonna need my model to transform it and the model goes out to the case sampler, simple. Alrighty, couple of comments on IP adapter. First of all, it has a weight, so you can change this. Maximum would be one, okay? And minimum would be zero, but there would be no point using it, just disable it. I think a just middle would be something like 0 0.3, 0 0.4 maybe, and it really depends on which model you use. If you use IP adapter plus, it's very strong. How strong? Well, let me show you. So if you put it all the way up, essentially, it 
tries to, and it's kind of interesting actually the effect. It's it's like the original image. It still looks like a video game, but you you're missing all the blocky element. Let me show you the original for comparison. Yeah, it looks like this. So we go from this to that. I think that's kind of a cool effect. Honestly, I haven't seen many people try it, and I think it's good fun. Uh, and as you decrease the IP adapter strength, you can see that instead of seeing the original image, what you're seeing is the effect of the high denoise we have set. So all the way to it's going to get back to photorealistic and eventually it's going to lose that composition, but it kept the clothes. And I think that's really cool, actually. The clothes are still very much on par and well reimagined. The backpack, the belt, uh, even the gloves are taken into account. I think that's really good fun. The background, because it was so pixelated, has been completely reinvented, but that's to be expected. So how you set the settings on this is completely up to you. Uh, but personally, I go for 0.4 if I use the strong model. Uh, and then I try a multiplicity of uh, elements. Maybe I use an XY grid, for example, to test this. There is no right setting. And I think that's what differentiates Confi from tools like Crea and Magnific is these tools, they give you this little three sliders, but Confi gives you control over the IP adapter, control over the denoise, control over the control nets, control over everything. You have full control with Confi. That's what's great about it. Next up, we have the control nets. So control nets are a completely different breed to IP adapter. Let me show you. So there is a series of nodes called Confi UI Control Net Aux by Fanovel16, another brilliant developer. And he's developed uh, these nodes that allow you to use any type, almost any type, of preprocessor. So you, what's a preprocessor? Well, it can be depth estimation, like Marigold, for example. That's the new and hot one. Uh, but there's plenty of others. There's Midas, there's Zoe Depth Anything. Uh, in fact, there's more. There's Lires Depth Map, Bay Normal Map. Uh, if you want it, you can also use Open Pose. That's how the animations are made. Like if you've seen those videos where someone dances, I have a tutorial on that. I have a workflow up as well. Uh, you can download that on the same website where I'll put this workflow. And the only catch with these tools is that you have to use the right one for the job. So which one is the right one for the job? Well, it depends on the image. There's no magic answer, despite what some are saying. I find obviously canny edges, this one, uh, tends to work quite well because it has a lot of information about the image that humans can immediately recognize as in this case a face, someone wearing a hat, hair, etc. But it may not be very good at keeping the gender. That's why you have IP adapter, of course. Realistic line art is very similar to Canny. You also have a scribble one. That one is, is far more vague. As you can see, the output looks completely different. So again, it could be good fun. It completely depends on what you need. Personally, I'm quite partial to the ones that relate to depth. Specifically, I find that Midas is slightly better in some instances than Zoe Depth Anything. Although Zoe Depth Anything does a better job at picking things up like hands. So it really depends what you want to do with this. And this is also the set of nodes that has the mesh graphformer. So I suppose you kind of need it anyway. Uh, it's got open pose. It's got an animal pose, which I'd love to try because I really want to make uh, virtual AI cows. <laughs> I think it would be quite funny. And it's got another one, which I've put into the tutorial, which is the segmentator. So just so you're aware, what a segmentor is, is essentially capturing layers of the image in a parallax type effect. So the front usually tends to be red and the back tends to be, I don't know, green, yellow, etc. And then you can create masks based on that if it's a single image. So I wouldn't stop at the tutorial personally. I would go even further. But then I suppose you could argue, well, it becomes an image by image type process. I suppose it's what it kind of is really anyway. So let's get to it. Let's implement it. Right, so for this one, I chose a color control net that works only with SDXL because sometimes it's difficult to find SDXL control nets, plus this one is super easy to implement. So you need load advanced control net, and then you need to apply the control net. That's it, two nodes, the end. It's really that simple. So unlike IP adapter, which takes a model, this one takes takes conditioning. So you're going to drag conditioning positive and negative and the positive and negative back to your pipeline. It simply sits in the middle of your conditioning. Of course, you need to pass it the base image and that's going to be used as well, the control, right? So the base image, if you will, is analyzed for depth, analyzed for colors in this case. Uh, it could be analyzed for anything, depends on your control net. And then you choose the control net that you wish to have. I've downloaded a bunch. That's not all of them. There's far more than that because that's my tutorial machine, but you get the idea. 
So for this particular example, we're going to pick the color one. I just wanted to point out something important. You can name them whatever you want as long as you recognize them later on. Now, I happen to like this notation. If you prefer another notation, just go rename the file in your control net directory and you're done. I know that LoRa Recolor Rank 256 works well with SDXL, so I'm going to pick this one. Another thing about control net I want to show you because there's no point recreating those nodes one by one. Uh, essentially, they all work the same. So you load a control net. In this case, it's a depth one and you pass it to apply control net. The reason I use the advanced control net is because this set of nodes is compatible with animate diff. And sometimes I copy paste my nodes from one workflow to the other. We've all done that. It's not, it's not a dirty thing to do or anything like that. Uh, and it's just simpler. Uh, the other thing to note is some control nets, not all, but some do use a preprocessor. That's the one we were just looking at on the website. In this case, Zoe Depth Anything as a preprocessor. There's one thing that's important here is it takes what's called a resolution. What's the resolution, you ask? It's simple. It's the shortest side of the image that you pass it. So the original image, if it's a landscape, obviously the horizontal resolution is going to be longer, wider, whatever the word is, than the vertical resolution. And vice versa, if it's a portrait, it's going to have a wider height than a width. So to calculate this, I've put this set of nodes that do a little Boolean comparison and that puts the shortest side. It's that simple. So you can reuse this, by the way, copy paste. You can even clip it uh, and use it as part of the clip space in Confi. Moving on to the next one, I've put the segmenter. Now, the reason I highlight this one is because you'll notice that it has a control V11 PSD15 seg FP16 safe tensors, <laughs> which is quite a mouthful, really. And in reality, there is no counterpart in SDXL land. Uh, now, I, I'm aware that there are workarounds to this, but it's quite outside the scope of this tutorial. Just remember that if you're using the segmenter, you're going to need to use an SD 1.5 model. And if you use the color one, you're going to need to use an SDXL model. So it's an or, not an and here. And in general, though, I really, really, really wouldn't want you to learn that way, really. Like, oh, we're stuck with this because he said that. No. First of all, you didn't pay anything for this, so you can do whatever the <coughs> you want. And second, there are tons of tons of tutorials on how to do this. For example, this is my bagel workflow. You can download it from the website. It's a little bit messy, but it has the advantage of I wanted to try everything type of approach. So I've put all of the control nets and their preprocessors. I mean, almost all. And you can see how it's done and how they work basically for each control net. You can actually, it's kind of nice. You can see the conditioning being passed here. And if you didn't want to use one, by the way, just right click, choose bypass there and it's done. It's going to skip this one. You're not going to process the line art. You're going to process all the others. What matters is that you're happy with the result. Nothing else matters, guys. Seriously. Talking about results and before you start playing with the settings, I wanted to show you this because this is really important and you're going to need it if you have less than, say, 16 gig of VRAM, I would say more or less based on my test. So. As you understand, the way this workflow functions is it takes your base image, it upscales it by using either a CCSR upscale or a model upscale. Don't do both, okay, that's obvious. If you were to choose the CCSR upscale, as you understand, it can go up to 6x, even 8x. That's huge, that's huge. And since we're going to have artifacts on this image, we need to pass it to a second case sampler Preferably, we will even rerun the face detailer, but I've only did once because otherwise it's going to be too big for most machines. And talking about most machines, that's what Tile Diffusion does. It helps with this. So if your latent is gigantic and you pass it to the case sampler in the second pass, it's going to break your machine. I guarantee you it will, even a 4090. What you want to do is you want to break it into tiles. And tiles is great because it's a single node that takes a model in and a model out. And it just sits in the middle and it works automatically. That's my favorite way of working. The only thing you need to remember is that the tile width and height, it's preferable if you stick it to the same train resolution as the model, meaning for SDXL, it's going to be 1024. Okay. That being said, it's super useful. And at 1024, it works super great for CCSR. CCSR, as you now know, can leave some seams. And this is a great way to pass a CCSR image through to remove the seams. I know one of you at least had that problem. So 
mate, I got you covered. Tile diffusion, that's how you do it. So I also wanted to cover a few potential issues you can encounter with this workflow. The first one is that RG3 is a brilliant node, but it does have bugs sometimes. So if you find that you can't turn off certain control net groups, that's probably because it broke and you need to pass it through the link fixer of RG3, which is included with the RG3 node. Very easy to use. The second thing you might encounter, I'm going to press Q and I'm going to get module list object as no attribute one. If you get an error like this, what it is, is you've used a 1.5 model with an SDXL control net or vice versa. And trust me, it's better that way. The worst thing that can happen to you is that it works, except it does nothing. And you think, oh, it worked, but it didn't. So here, for example, I use the LoRa depth rank to 5.6, which as you know now is SDXL only. So sure, the preprocessor will work. I mean, no doubt. But when you run it, it fails at the case sampler step, okay? So to fix that, you go in here, and you choose a control net that will work with SD 1.5. In this case, it's going to be control V11 F1 PSD. Uh, this is boring, okay? It's this one. I hit Q and now it works again. And it looks like this. I think this is pretty damn cool if you ask me. I can't believe how good it is at keeping the colors consistent and the clothing. Uh, okay, sure, the office background is kind of funny, but push come to shove, you could always create a mask and mask it out. The other problem you can encounter is if you get images that end up looking like this. So that's actually because you set up your control net strength way too high. So if we go look at, for example, the segmenter on the Tomb Raider image, we can see that the segmenter, it just says, hey, there's red and then there's the rest, the end. So it's only, it's gonna keep that sort of weird video game looking thing. It's gonna mix it up with everything. I think I have a IP adapter, yeah, turn all the way up. That's a bad idea. So eventually you get bad results if you go too high with the settings. And keep in mind that IP adapter is to transfer a style. Think of it as an instant LoRa, really. And control nets is to conform to a certain shape or a certain position. If you were to use open pose, for example, instead, um, a certain composition, if you're using depth, and therefore they have to be used lightly. And usually you use them in conjunction with the denoise setting. The higher the denoise, the more you're going to want to use the control nets, and then you might lose some coherence in your image. The lower the denoise, the less you need to use the control nets. In fact, you get to the point where you don't need to use them at all. So I've run a bunch of tests for you guys to look at the results and get an idea of what this can or cannot do. Uh, here I use the famous Lara Croft picture that was used by Magnific for their marketing materials. I think that the outcome is excellent. It's better, in my opinion, than what we get through Kriya, for example. The problem with that Kriya image, in my opinion, is that the neck is completely deformed. And you can almost tell that they're using some sort of control net for the depth. Uh, that's why you have, uh, let's say, pointy things on this image. Uh, anyway, uh, and it seems to have confused the video game elements with the realistic elements and not do a good job at integrating both. Whereas the config UI version uh, was able to, with a lot of tweaking, of course, and a lot of modification of parameters, get a good balance between the two. Next, I uploaded this picture of uh, three gentlemen uh, because I wanted to see how complex the image could get before face detailer failed, and it supported very well, picked up all three faces, no problem. The issue I had was the eyes, but it turns out that's actually this gentleman's eyes orientation. So you come to your own conclusion as to what that means. And for the teeth that looks a little bit off here, I was able to fix it later by just switching the seed to a different number. So I went to, I think it was triple eight instead of triple seven. A common problem that's highlighted here is that it smooth out it smoothes out the faces a lot. It doesn't add detail. Now, the, this is the same problem here on this person's face. There's no added detail. Whereas the tools like Magnific and Kriya are excellent at adding detail. Now, I'm fully aware that we can try to inject noise. In fact, I left a noise injector in the tutorial, but it didn't work well in my testing. What I found was it just blurred out the image or left some artifacts without injecting details in the face. So if you really need to inject detail, go for the paid tools. Here you're looking at the Magnify official homepage and their cherry pick test. And here you're looking at the workflow. I'm very surprised by this test. I expected it to be considerably inferior to Magnific, but it turned out actually pretty good. It did not inject detail as expected, but by playing with the control net and the IP adapter, I was able to recover 
a better representation of the original image as opposed to a reinvented version of it. I was also pleased with this test on a cat that I downloaded from the internet. I mean, it wouldn't be a test if there wasn't a cat from the internet, I suppose. I used the Leo Sam Hello World XL V4, not V5, but you can try V5, of course, nothing stops you. And I found that it was really good at animals, really, really good. It basically completely reinvents the image, but here it's quite subtle and it did a really good job on the fur. It did an excellent job on the little whiskers. Overall, I'm very pleased with this and I would say it's completely a valid solution. Another cat, this one is 20 years old. Uh, poor cat may, may not be with us anymore. Uh, here, it was obviously a terrible base picture with a lot of noise in the original and it completely smoothed out the noise. It even picked up this little pal and it reinvented it, which I think is brilliant. Uh, I'm very, very happy with this result, especially with the textures on the bed. It really did a brilliant job at figuring out that this was indeed a duvet and picturing it properly. Okay, well, I think we demonstrated that it's perfectly possible to get decent results with very little work in Config UI. But evidently there are limitations, specifically details in the image cannot be injected properly at this point in time. Hopefully we'll see changes that leads to that. Talking about changes, there's a new node that just dropped as I was finishing the editing on this video. Literally a few hours ago, Kijai released a wrapper for Suphir, which is another stable diffusion upscaler. It's excellent, like everything Kijai does, but I didn't get a chance to review it. So once it's a little bit more stable, I'll of course have a video on it. In fact, if you enjoy this type of video, I have many more. They should appear on the screen right now. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you all on Discord, and I really look forward to know what you've built with this and how you improve this workflow further. Cheers, guys. See you later.